that in and of itself maybe doesn't sound like it's about health per se, but I think it is, and I think it speaks a lot to the subject matter at hand. It's a, a story from about 14 years ago now, when I had just gotten out on the lecture circuit back in 1996, and I'd begun to go around the country and speak about these subjects, not so much racism and health, but just sort of racism more broadly and racial disparity more broadly. And I was speaking at St. Joseph's University in Indiana. There are several St. Joe's. This is not the one in Philly. This is the one in Rensselaer, Indiana. It's a much smaller, uh, much less metropolitan, much less cosmopolitan, much more isolated. And I'd only been out for about uh, a year or a year and a half speaking around the country on these topics. But it was a very interesting moment, and it's one I won't forget. Because when I was done, a young man came up to me after the talk and after the question and answer session. He came up to me, young man, young African-American male, about 21 years of age, roughly, a senior, he said, uh, at St. Joseph's. And he came up to me and he said, I'd like to speak to you for a second, if I could. He didn't want to talk to me in front of everyone. He actually wanted to talk with me somewhat privately. And I said, sure. So I walked over to the side with him after everyone else had started to leave. And he said, you know, I have to be honest, I've never felt comfortable telling anyone, especially anyone who was white, what I'm about to tell you. But I need to tell you this because I need to get this off my chest and I, I need to have someone who I can speak to about it. And there's no one here. It's a very white place, both Rensselaer, Indiana and St. Joseph's College or University, whichever one it is that happens to be in Rensselaer. He was not, uh, to put it mildly, in the majority population at that institution or in that town. And he said, uh, you know, I've been here for three and a half years. And in the three and a half years that I've been here, i got to tell you, I feel like every couple of days, certainly every week, regularly, over and over again, I'm having to just sort of deal with these little bitty things. Nothing major, no overt racism, no cross burnings, no overt racial slurs, no, no, nothing that would be, you know, for most people, obvious indications of racism. But it's one little thing after another, one little comment after another, one little remark after another, one little joke, one little look. It's when I go shopping, it's when I'm in class, it's when I'm walking across the campus. And he said, in the three and a half years that I've been here, I haven't been able to talk to any white person about this. And there aren't a lot of black folks to speak with about it. We do talk about it. But never have I been able to talk to anyone who was white. Not a counselor, right? not a faculty member, not an RA in the residence halls, not anyone on this campus. Because I feel like if I do, they're going to think I'm crazy. Because it's nothing blatant. It's nothing obvious. It's nothing that they would have seen manifested on this campus. So I just keep stuffing it. And I feel like maybe you'll be able to understand this and at least validate that my truth is real, that my experience is real. And he said, and i got to tell you, if I don't get some sense that I'm not crazy, and if I don't get that sense really soon that I'm not crazy for somebody else, i got to tell you, one more thing happens, and he had three months left, four months left, before the school year was going to be over and he was going to graduate. He said, I swear to God, one more thing, and I'm going to go off. And I don't know if I can control the way that I go off, what it is I'm going to say or what I'm going to do. And the sad thing is, if I do go off, one little look, one little comment, maybe it's not even about race, but if I think it is, I swear to God, I'm going to pop. And when I do, they're going to think I'm insane. And I'm going to be escorted off this campus, and I'm not going to graduate. My whole life is going to be ruined. That's how I feel every day when I wake up. Is today going to be the day? Well, of course, I did validate his experience. Sad that I would need to do that sad that anyone would have to validate the experience of a fully grown man who is more than capable of interpreting his own life and more than capable of intuiting what it is that he's going through. But I did it anyway because he asked for it and he needed it and I gave it to him and I told him, you know, a few things that I thought might help him get through. Basically, that was the only goal at that point was just to get him through. Now, unfortunately, I lost contact with that young man. It was, after all, 1996. We didn't have email. Most of us at that time, I didn't. Didn't have a cell phone. You know, the cell phones back in 96 were like the size of this water bottle or bigger. Nobody really wanted to carry them around, even if you could, even if you had one. You didn't really want to be seen with it in most cases. So, so I lost touch with him, and I have no idea what happened to him. But what I thought about in the years since was that here was a young man who was learning at a very early age. There was one thing he was not to speak of. There was one thing that he couldn't talk about to people in positions of authority, especially if they were white, in spite of his life experience, in spite of the stress that he was experiencing as a black man, fully functioning, not insane, not at all you know, off his rocker, so to speak, fully capable of interpreting his life. He was learning to stuff those experiences, to not speak of them, to not talk about his real life encounters with racism. Sadly, his personal example, I came to understand in the intervening years between now and then, uh, serve as something of a metaphor for the way we as a country operate when it comes to these subjects. 
It's not just individuals who learn at a relatively early age that they're not to speak of this issue. It is a country, it is a culture that unfortunately has learned collectively that we are not to speak of. It's also a metaphor for how we tend to deal with the subject of health in this country because the only advice that I could really give him was coping advice. Right? It was how to fix him. It was how to let him get through, how to help him cope. That's how we deal with health. We end up thinking about health as how can we fix the sick? Which is why many say we don't have a system of health care in this country. We have a system of sick care. We take care of people after they are ill. We don't do a lot to prevent illness on the front end, certainly not as much as many other cultures that we like to compare ourselves to. So here was a young man who was learning not to speak of racism, much like if you've seen the film Fight Club. What is the first rule of Fight Club? The first rule of Fight Club is you don't speak about Fight Club. It's a secret. You're not supposed to talk about it. And in this country, race is the dirty little secret, and racism, the dirty little secret about which we're not supposed to speak, especially now. You know, in the introductory remarks, you were being reminded of the sort of best of time scenario, at least symbolically, that there is, in fact, an African American governor, there is, in fact, a black president. But in spite of all this, we continue to have these vast disparities, and precisely because we have people of color in positions of authority. Precisely because we have the symbolic evidence of progress that we can see in terms of executive office leadership, whether it's in the state of Massachusetts or in the country as a whole, precisely because of that, it has ironically become more difficult than ever to have the conversation about the larger systemic subject. It would be much easier, would it not, to talk about racism as an ongoing social phenomenon if you didn't have those folks in those positions. But precisely because they're there, there are those who will look at that and say, well, see, now we can move on to something that is more edifying as a topic. We can move on to something that doesn't make us as uncomfortable. Thank God we're in this post-racial era where we don't need to speak of this as if we had ever really wanted to speak of it, even 20 years ago, even 50 years ago, even 100 years. So the election of Barack Obama signifies to some, some who are not paying very much attention, some who have cynical, political, and ideological motivations for saying it, that we're living in that post-racial era, which of course makes no more sense than it would have made in 1988 in the nation of Pakistan to suggest that the election of Benazir Bhutto meant that girls and women no longer face sexism in that country. Bhutto was elected twice. 1988 and again in 1991. No one in their right mind would have said that girls and women in Pakistan as a function of her election as a female somehow now faced no longer any institutional barriers of patriarchy and sexist oppression. Nor would we have said something so silly in Great Britain after Margaret Thatcher became the head of state or in Israel after Golda Meir did or in India after Indira Gandhi did. All four of those places, Pakistan, Israel, India, Great Britain, and others as well, have had female premiers. We know in those cases that symbolic representation, individual accomplishment, doesn't tell us anything about the larger systemic truth that millions of other people are facing. In those cases, women as women. In our case here in this country, folks of color as folks of color. Now, it's not that we won't acknowledge gaps. We will do that. We will acknowledge disparities. We're at least at the point as a society where we are willing to admit that in fact there are profound inequities of outcome, whether it's in terms of health, whether it's in terms of education, whether it's in terms of income and occupational status. We will acknowledge that, but unfortunately that's where the conversation ends. We'll acknowledge the disparity. We will not dig to find out the source of that disparity. We will stop the excavation of the problem only at the surface level instead of digging quite a bit deeper to find what lies underneath. And so we will admit that there are profound racial gaps in terms of health outcomes between white folks, for example, on the one hand, and black folks on the other, between white folks on the one hand and Latinos on the other, between white folks on the one hand and indigenous Native North Americans on the other. But oftentimes, we won't try to find out to what extent, if any, racism, discrimination, et cetera, are still at the root of that. It is as if we believe that those inequities emerge either by accident, by osmosis, by coincidence, or by virtue of some other force other than racism, but never that one. We're never to speak of that one, just like we are not to speak of Fight Club. We are not to speak, in the case of that young man at St. Joseph's, of his own personal experience. So we take the perception that all we need to do if we want to close those gaps is have a stronger economy. If people have better jobs, if they have access to health care, a rising tide, as the saying goes, will lift all boats, and that will solve the problem. And so once again, we look to a structural solution, but it is one that still studiously avoids the subject of racism and conflates the issue of race and class, suggesting that the only real obstacles to quote-unquote minority health are obstacles of economics and access, when indeed 
actual situation is considerably more complicated than that. This is the thing that I call in my latest book post-racial liberalism. 